board. All right, so Matt, welcome to the Empty Crept, man. It is an honor to have you on, sir. And I'm very thrilled to have you here. So jumping into the first question. So for those who don't know who you are or what you do, can you give us a little insight about your life and what you do? Um, I'm nobody special. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'm just, uh, just a simple indie horror filmmaker. Uh, I've been in the quote unquote business since uh, roughly, gosh, I guess two, around 2005, 2006. Uh, I started out as a special makeup effects artist. Uh, worked on a few movies, uh, doing effects, and worked my way up. Um, shot my shot my first feature uh, around 2007 ish. Uh, didn't get it completed until like 2009, and hell, I don't think I it was released until like 2014 or some crazy shit like that. So, but uh, that was a learning experience. But I mean, what movie isn't? Um, but since then, you know, I've been working on indie films here and there and uh, took a little break for a while. And then and I recently came back and uh, finished my movie Beneath the Old Dark House, which, which was just released a couple months ago through uh, Scream Team Releasing. And uh, I basically hit the ground running right after the release of that with, uh, with my new movie, uh, Coffin Tooth. And here we are. All right. Yeah. So just talking about Coffin Tooth, man, where did the idea come from? Did you draw from other movies that you've seen? Uh, it's, uh, it's a huge mixture. Um, so the character of Coffin Tooth has been kind of in my head gestating for a really long time. I actually had this character, um, not so much like his face, but kind of like his look and his mannerisms and stuff like that. Way back, I think... Um, Gosh, I want to say it was the late 90s, early 2000s when I actually came up with like the, the outline, I guess you would call it, of the character. He was kind of like a scarecrow um, type character when I created him. And uh, every time I would write a new project, I would try to somehow fit him in, but it just never, never really worked out the way I wanted it to. So it was just one of those characters that's just been in the back of the mind for a really long time. So when we did Beneath the Old Dark House, um, well, actually, I'll, I'll take a, I'll actually take that back a little bit further. Um, so Lewis Brown, who owns uh, Darkwood Manor, is a local haunted house here in my town. I've known him since, gosh, since like straight out of high school. And he makes all kinds of crazy monsters and mask and madman and creatures and stuff. And I really admired his work. And uh, he had made this mask for, for one of his people at uh, the haunted house. And he's known to, um, after a couple uses for the haunted house, he'll sell them or, or do whatever. So I knew that he had that mask and I didn't know if he was hanging on to it anymore. So I hit him up and I was like, hey man, um, you still have that mask and uh, could I buy it off of you? And he said, yeah. And that, that was that. Cause when I saw that mask, I knew I was like, shit, man, that is coffin tooth like that. Or I didn't, he hadn't have his name yet, but that's the character because he had cause burlap and it's like stitched together from like bits and pieces and stuff. So I knew it was great. Mm -hmm. Um, so we create the, you know, we took that character and basically put his look together and I, we did Beneath the Old Dark House and I didn't have a name for him. So the name Coffin Tooth wasn't until very recent, but the character has kind of been around for a while. And I wish I could tell a more like, uh, exciting story of how the name came about, but it was literally, uh, I was at work talking to, uh, one of my bosses of all things. And I was like, I'm trying to come up with a name for this for this guy and I, you know, I'm, nothing's coming to me. I'm like, I want something to do with like, you know, a coffin or a crypt or something and something to do with like, you know, the, 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 uh, the face or the body or something. And literally he just said coffin tooth. And I just perked up. I said, that sounds really fucking cool. And that's, and that's literally all there was to it. So there was really no, uh, you know, I, I can't sit here and say that I came up with the name or <laughs> that it's a name that's been around forever, but, uh, yeah, my friend, uh, my, my, he was one of my bosses at, at my uh, uh, last job and a uh, really cool dude and a friend of mine, his name's Jimmy. So he came up with the name. I had the character and the look already. And that was it. Alpha Tooth was born. Man, so, I mean, that's kind of, that's cool just to kind of know a little bit of the backstory because I was always wondering, like, where did this guy get his name from Coffin Tooth? You know, it's, it's unique, but it's catchy, though, too. I feel like. Oh, it's really catchy. 
it, it definitely stands out. So like how much of, uh, cause to me, when I look at the costume of, of coffin tooth, I instantly, uh, start thinking about, um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre as kind of mm-hmm. like the feel that I get looking. So like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, play oh, yeah. this. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the, the chains, the, the entire chainsaw franchise is of course, one of my favorite horror franchises and I love Leatherface. Um, and I'm one of those people that I love all the sequels, no matter how, how shitty or bad they are. Um, <laughs> but there's certain, um, there's certain ticks and performances, um, throughout all the different Leatherface actors, um, throughout the years that I've really gravitated towards. And, uh, that probably sounds weird saying that I'm gravitating towards a, a serial killer, but that's not what I mean. I mean, like, I really like the performance wise, um, there's some things that always stuck out to me um that i've found unsettling that i noticed that not a lot of people talk about but when they talk about the character being unsettling they just say he's unsettling they never say why and i always feel like maybe it's because of the performance now not you know every actor brings something different to the role Mm -hmm. um like andrew branarski who played leatherface in the in the remake and the prequel remake uh, that's a very brutish imposing figure um which is awesome and scary that's not what necessarily makes it scary to me it's a miss um like bill johnson's portrayal of leatherface and, and chainsaw too um it's almost like the frankenstein theory where it's a brain of a child inside of the uh, you know the body of a, of a huge man and like that's always um kind of piqued my interest with characters and stuff so with coffin tooth uh, i'm also a huge gigantic uh you know old school monster fan frankenstein and stuff like that now, I think that's why Frankenstein is my favorite monster is because he's got that childlike quality inside of the body of a, of a you know, creature or a monster or whatever. So that's what I want to do with Coffin Tooth was, um, you know, there, there's nothing redeeming about the character. I don't want to try to come off as, you know, he's a child to so feel sorry for him. No, he, he's very much uh, an evil piece of shit, <laughs> but he's, uh, he's also got the mind of a child and it's very... It's a it's a marriage between your hillbilly horror and your um, your like Evil Dead uh, supernatural kind of mythology kind of married together. I don't want to get too much more into it because it'll kind of start um, maybe revealing a little bit too much about Coffin oh. Tooth. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, uh, try not to try to. I, I ramble a lot, so you have to excuse me. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so it, the Coffin Tooth. Um, New Leatherface, by, you know, by far was definitely a big inspiration behind the character. And I, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to tell in some, some pictures and I'm, I'm glancing down, might as well bring him up now. Um, so it's hard to tell in some pictures, but if you look really oh. closely, like it's not like Leatherface, it's not like skin stitched together and stuff like that. It's literally like trinkets and burlap and leather straps and uh, safety pins and old dentures um, that he is that he has pieced together um, to to make this mask. And there's two masks uh, in the movie. There is a young coffin tooth, and of course the the main character. So young coffin tooth has a proto uh, proto mask, and it's you know a burlap stitched together sack with like a button for an eye and like uh, animal like a, I can't remember what type of animal is supposed to be, but like little like animal jaw bones, um, mm-hmm. like glued to the mouth and make them look like teeth. So I just want to give, you know, give the effect that he's not like Leatherface where he takes people's skin or anything like that, but he's very much, um, he likes making a makeshift mask out of bits and pieces that he's got laying around um, mm-hmm. to cover his face. So just something a little, a little like it, it, it again, you know, it is very reminiscent of Leatherface, but it's, it's also its own little thing. His own entity, man. That mask is creepy. Like it yeah. really is. It the really freaking, is, man. So, like, what is so? What is the the ultimate goal for you with this? Um, with the launch of your movie, because I know you've you've already been filming a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the movie is movie's roughly in the ballpark of seventy percent done. Um, oh. actually, I mean, we film again in two weeks. Um, and after we film, we're, we're, so we're filming May 19th, 20th, and 21st, and then we're taking uh, a couple weeks break, and then we're jumping back in in June for a couple of days, and then I'm t- we take July and August off, because where I live here in Virginia, um, 
the humidity like you might you might as well be filming in the heart of texas it's so hot and humid here and uh i'm a big guy and i can't take the heat for nothing and i uh my temper flares so to save everybody from sweating their ass off and 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 you know uh tempers colliding we take off the summer and uh september we're going to be filming for three days and that'll be the last uh technical three days of shooting um after that I think we're going to film for like maybe a day in October, which is just pick up shots, the party goer scenes and stuff like that. And then movies, movies done, which is kind of poetic because we started shooting this movie that nobody really knows this. Um, but we actually started shooting this movie in September. So we'll be finishing it in September. So it took a whole year, but it does is this the first movie where it a year completely flew by for me and probably because of we started in September and then you got, you know, Halloween and then the holidays yeah. hit. So everything just happens so fast. And, and now here we are, it's almost a year, but um, it'd also be one of the quickest movies I've had a turnaround on. So, you know, a for effort on that, I guess. For sure, man. Um, so like, what's, what's the goal for you? Are you wanting this to become like, you know, a, a classic, if you will, like, is there, is, because I know there's been a lot of people, your Indiegogo campaign was phenomenal the, for the finishing and all that good stuff. So congratulations on running a successful Thank campaign. Uh, so like, what, what's the goal in mind for you with Coffin Tooth? Uh, I mean, every filmmaker, well, every, I should say every horror filmmaker that's uh, creating something new and different that's not a remake or a reboot or a requel or whatever the fuck kids call it nowadays um every everybody wants their character to be the next freddy the next jason the next michael myers the next leatherface so on and so forth um while i would love to sit here and tell you uh yeah my goal was for leatherface i mean uh coffin tooth to become the next leatherface um it's honestly it's just like i didn't even think i was going to be doing this movie when uh you know when i finished beneath the old dark house it was always that little part of me like i don't think i'm going to keep doing movies anymore um, but then there was actually a huge response uh, to that movie and to the character, and I saw the value in that character. So, you know, that's why I decided to do this movie. But as far as like future goal of trying to make Leatherface into something, um, it's something I would maybe like to do, but I, that's not a certain goal that I've set. And I mean, I, I hate to sound like the, you know, the, the filmmaker that kind of like, talks down on himself or whatever but like as far as like any kind of goals i'm just trying to make something fun and uh, a cool movie that i enjoy hopefully other people do too um so there's no real like aspirations uh or anything like that but if he does become you know if it does pick up and, and become something cool that's of course even better the only the only really i guess you can say future goal i have for coffin tooth is um if if it is going to continue after this movie, which I I think it, it's got a future, um, there's only two movies <laughs> left in the franchise for me, and mm -hmm. uh, it's 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 another sequel, and then after that, if I was to do one more, the only way um, that it's going to happen is if it's a versus movie. If I can get uh, Coffin Tooth versus uh, Dave Kerr's Slasher Nurse, or um, you know, or Coffin Tooth versus, you know, some other indie, if I can find another indie filmmaker who's got another character mm -hmm. um, that's their own creation, I would love to do like a first like indie crossover with Coffin Tooth and have him. And like, here's the thing, like, I don't even, I don't even care if fucking Coffin Tooth loses. I just want to make a, a, I thought it'd be fun to see, you know, a versus movie eventually. So that's the only real, I, I shouldn't say even goals or ideas that I have. Um, but other than that, there's real no, uh, set goal see you know I, I think it's funny you actually mentioned that the verses because i'm actually a fan of you know the monster versus monster or mm -hmm. creature creature you know movies and it's like nowadays it's like you don't have a a, a lot of that necessarily you know everybody right. should, um you know i don't, I don't want to sound like a critic or anything but like you know everybody's trying to do what the next person is doing you know mm -hmm. just their own variation of it so i think you know you trying to go back into that monster versus my, man i love that and i feel like people will value that because i feel like that's what we need we need that kind of goofy monster versus monster you got you know some klutzy chicks that get killed you know that is what you know we as indie lovers see so i mean but speaking of indie though like 
what are some of the difficulties that you face with trying to produce this movie and your other projects that you had in the past? Uh, I, I, I could I could sit here and try to write a fucking novel, honestly. Um, I don't know if I've ever had any of my movies go smoothly. Um, and there seems that there's always, always a huge fucking roadblock in the way. And it's always something, whether it be... Um, Issues with crew, issues with editing, issues with both, uh, issues with egos colliding on set. And, um, you know, I, I've always said since I made my first movie, you, when you make a movie, every single movie is a lesson. And that lesson is what to do and what not to do the next time. So with each movie I've worked on, of course, I've made sure like, okay, well, this didn't go well make sure that in the next one we we cut that shit out and um i again i, I don't want I, I could literally sit here for probably two hours and, and just tell you terrible bullshit and terrible stories and terrible people and uh and egos that come with it which just it shocks me and just blows me away the amount of ego that you can find in indie filmmakers and um it's the dumbest fucking thing i i've ever seen and then this is see this is where I'll go off on tangents and, and shit. So you'll have to sometimes you'll have to kind of steer steer me back. But um, I just I just I just want to say real quick that um, it's the dumbest fucking thing because as an indie filmmaker, you are scraping and clawing your way to trying to make art, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think the best way to show art or showcase your art or do art is kind of surround yourself with like-minded people and people that do the things that you do and people that enjoy doing the things that you do. And there's such a, I don't know, I guess rivalry or lack of a better term out there where um, I've literally, you know, on Facebook seen some filmmaker, like they won't maybe mention names, but they like are like, oh, well, so-and-so did this. And it's just like, dude, that's, that's shut up. Like if it's not directly affecting you, if it's not hurting anyone, keep your, keep, you know, keep people's projects out of your mouth unless it's there to praise. And I know it's not like, a, like people will say participation awards and stuff like that. It's not that. It's not where you should, because there are terrible filmmakers out there too, you know? <laughs> um, so I, I can't sugarcoat that and I can't pretend that terrible filmmakers don't exist. But I feel like there's a certain standard that we should all, you know, hold ourselves to. But there's also, on the other hand, like we need to hold each other up we need to promote each other. We need to help each other and stuff like that. So that's something I, I'm starting to see maybe a little bit, you know, kind of pick up and there's more support and stuff like that, which is great. Um, but to go back to your question about, you know, the atrocities and the and, and hardships of, of making a movie, uh, everybody's got an agenda. And that's something that I think every filmmaker needs to know, no matter who it is, whether it's your whether it's your sound guy or, you know, the person running the slate or, or whoever, like not everybody is there for you. They've mm -hmm. got um, their own agenda. And, you know, half the time, a lot of your crew, they're there for resume reasons. And um, while that's fun, I'll never make another movie with a, uh, with a straight lace crew ever again. Because it's almost it almost feels corporate in a way, even though it's not. It's indie filmmaking, but it, mm -hmm. like I, I worked on the movie. I'm not going to name anything, but I worked on the movie where I was the only like in like indie guerrilla filmmaker on the set. Everybody else was film school brats, and like I was treated like I was some like peasant peon, and I was just like, who who wants this? Like who wants to work? Who wants to make art where you're felt like you don't belong? Because mm. I'm where I come from, the artists were the outcast, and those are the ones that are supposed to stick together. So I, after that experience, I was like, no, fuck that, never again. Um, I didn't go to film school. I'm self-taught. I've, you know, I've had to crawl under barbed wire fences. I've had to reach down in the mud and crawl and, to make movies, and uh, that's just how I do it. And I'm not talking down on film school. Film school is great. Um, it's just not for me, but I don't feel like whether you go to school or not, um, it should matter in mentality. You should treat everybody equal. Everybody's artists. Everybody's trying to make something cool. And if you're working on a project together, you should all come together collectively to make that piece of art. So anyway, that's, that's what I got to say about 
the hardships of filmmaking. Just try to get along with everybody, try to make the right decisions. And I think um, something that a lot of younger uh, up and coming filmmakers need to learn is when you cast your movies, um, you put out casting calls and you try to pick the right person for the part, you should really do that with your crew too. Um, you know, don't, don't pick somebody just because somebody said they worked great on their set, actually interview them, have a talk with them. Yeah. Uh, you know, if they're, if they're close by, uh, go have a beer with them or something, break the ice, see if you gel well, cause if you gel well, then you're probably going to have a good time. If you don't gel well, just having a meeting and shooting the shit, and guess what? It's probably not going to be too much fun on set. Um, so that's the best thing I can, you know, best advice I could even give people is try to surround yourself with people that you like, the people that you would want to be with and around outside of um, filming. And I think you'll have an easier time. So that actually leads me to my, to my next question. So what made you select you know your cast like was it because like you know of the resumes or have you worked with these people prior so what made you want to select certain people for for coffin tooth um so like any any filmmaker whether it be uh like dave kerr who does you know this uh is getting ready to do the new slasher nurse movie and you know go, uh, go away is getting ready to come out you know like him like many other filmmakers how like even like rob zombie you you end up working with certain people that you know you have a good time with that you know are reliable that you know are, are good and then it's going to show up and bring their a game those are the people that i latch on to and i keep and when i'm writing my scripts i actually write parts for them and then everything else you know is casting call coffin tooth was one is one of the first projects where um not only the lead but the co-lead um are people that i've never worked with before um, usually I work, you know, I mainly work with people that I've always worked with before. Um, but this is kind of new. I'd say a good 70% of the cast, uh, is new to me. And uh-huh. then you got actors like Jim Crutt from Dawn of the Dead who I've worked with before. You know, I wrote, I wrote his part, especially for him, um, stuff like that. And, uh, so, but this was a, this was a different experience with casting all new people in a way. And it was kind of hard for me because there were so many roles that I kind of wanted to give to some other actors that I usually work with. But seeing as how Coffin Tooth is technically a uh, spinoff sequel from Beneath Your Dark House, it didn't make much sense to bring all everybody back to play different characters um, since they were just in the last one. <laughs> but I found ways around... Um, working that so there's there's a handful there's like a couple people here and there from the previous movie that's in this one and it's just because i love them dearly and want to put them in it but everybody else was all new so it was just a simple casting call of you know put the call out um we got a shit ton of auditions for the both the lead and co-lead and um our lead anna clary who plays uh, the role of parker um she sent in her audition and we we got a lot of auditions for for that role of parker and they were there were some really damn good ones and anna um sent hers in and i watched it and i immediately hit up my uh my uh well i shouldn't say assistant she's no longer my assistant she's a assistant director and executive producer uh, my friend katie i literally hit her up i was like hey you need to watch this right now tell me what you think and we both agreed that she was the one and it was that was pretty much that we hit her up and we're like, hey, can we do a, a Zoom call? And we talked to her and we just offered her the role, you know, right there on the spot. And then um, there was a couple more. There was a couple more actors. I think I cast just about everybody for the movie. And the last person that I cast, not counting like the new uh, celebrity additions that we added through uh, the campaign, but the mm-hmm. last like main cast member that we did was the character of Kimmy, which is the co-lead and best friend to the character of, uh, of Parker. And uh, uh, Spencer Sorry. Madison's uh, Spooky Madison, um, she has sent in an audition that was really fucking good. It was one of the best auditions I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. But there was, but her, um, her attitude for the character uh, was missing a little something. Her acting was phenomenal. So I just hit her up, I was like, hey, uh, could you do another audition, but do it in this mindset of this certain 
type of person and she understood the assignment and sent me another audition right away and uh that was that I knew she was the person for for the part so it was fun it was a mixture uh like I said of of bringing in people that I've worked with before that I knew were going to be good and mm -hmm. you know bringing in new people with auditions and I think auditions are actually a lot of fun um that's actually probably my new favorite part of filmmaking is is the auditions nice man so like with with it being a year you know with this what has been like the most rewarding thing uh during filming so like is it you seeing your your movie come to life like or is it like certain scenes that you envision and you're like oh wow that's exactly how i wanted it and better so like what's the most rewarding thing you've you've noticed during your time making oh movie? god so this is this is gonna be a funny question or funny answer um so the movie looks great the footage looks great all the all the scenes and shots i had in my head i feel like we we've we've we grab those. Um, the most rewarding thing that's happened. Um, I hope, hopefully this doesn't sound egotistical because I don't mean it to sound like a like an ego thing. But the most rewarding thing is my fucking plan worked. Um, I basically so the the first people that were on this job were myself, of course, because <laughs> I wrote the goddamn thing. Uh, my director of photography, uh, Jesse Knight, and our uh, our assistant director slash uh, deep our uh, assistant director slash EP executive producer, Katie Bennett. And we, I kind of told him like, all right, we're going to do this movie. I'm going to do another movie, but I'm not going to fuck myself like I did before, putting myself into debt, trying to use my own money. I had never really had success with campaigns in the, in the past. So um, I would always do everything out of pocket, which would not only would it put me in the debt and I'd be like, you know, scraping two pennies together, but also it made the movie like take that much longer to get completed because, you know, I'm working on nine to five trying to save up money to make a movie. So with Coffin Tooth, I was like, look, I'm making, I'm putting together a plan and hopefully this plan works to get this movie made. And the plan was kind of simple. Um, film three days worth of footage on my own dime. And then after that, launch a campaign that way we've got enough footage to show behind the scenes pictures and stills mm -hmm. just to show people like what we're doing. Um, and then we, you know, we did our first campaign. We shot again in October and we, you know, we got more footage, stuff like that. And then uh, we just recently shot again in, uh, in March. And so after that, I was like, all right, cool. My plan is my plan is working or whatever. And then somebody, some people had to hit me up and ask me if I was going to do a finishing funds campaign. And I was like, oh, I don't. Well, that seems like a couple years ago, that was kind of frowned upon to do a second one. Now it seems to be the norm. So I kind of put out feelers on Facebook, you know, asking around, like, what do you guys think? And everybody's like, yeah, sure, you should do it. Um, so I was like, all right, cool. So before I did that, um, I started releasing more images from stuff that we had just shot. And so you, I grabbed the attention of not only the people that just donated before, but now it was pulling in all these new people and it made our campaign, our second campaign, even much, even that much more successful. Um, so much so that we were able to raise enough money to add more uh, celebrity actors to the, to the mix. And uh, I think that was the most rewarding thing was we put together a plan and uh, you know, cross my fingers, knock on wood, that plan continues. Uh, to work, but that's been the most rewarding is uh, I do most of the shit by myself. Uh, mm -hmm. All the planning, the plotting, uh, getting getting things together. Like I'm in the room I'm sitting in right now, like this entire side of the room is like, looks like Sanford and Son because it's all the props <laughs> and shit like that. Um, you know, that I've, that, I, that I've been getting uh, put together and stuff. Okay. So it, it's, it's, it's uh, that's the hardest part putting it together by myself. But uh, the rewarding thing is plan worked. I got everything together. I've been kind of strategically blueprinting everything out step by step. So by the time we get ready to shoot, you know, here, grab a box. This has got this stuff in it. Here, grab a box. This has got this stuff in it. All right, this goes here. This goes here. This goes here. Let's rock and roll. And um, because something in the past has always sucked is with an effects background, um, it's hard for me not to get my fingers, you know, messy mm -hmm. with, with, with doing effects also. And something that's been um, in the past, that's kind of a 
kind of an issue. Not with not nobody's really ever ever said it's an issue, but to myself it is. Is um, pulling myself in too many different directions on set. You know, trying to answer everybody's questions, trying to direct a scene, trying to answer your actors' questions, trying to answer your cinematographer's questions, uh, trying to make sure this person's costume looks right because I'm also the costume designer. Um, all these different things, and after a while, it wears on you. So even though I'm still doing all those things, I'm doing those things beforehand. And mm-hmm. that way, when we get on set, I can hand those things off to those people and be like, all right, here, here, here's your stuff. Here's what you're supposed to do with them. Go. And I don't really have, I can go work on my directing duties. And uh, it feels a lot better this time than trying to, to do all the juggling on set. For sure. So, I mean, hearing you kind of talk about it now is this project have a different feel from the other projects that you know that you've done or that you produce like this is feel this is feel like the one does it feel special it does feel special um gosh i don't know if i should how far into this i should get um i guess i'll 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 mention it and then if you want to talk about it later we can um but i but i have a project that i've been working on for uh, a fucking decade and that movie is also um probably like 80 percent done but there was a lot of financial issues that we ran into kind of stopping me from finishing it and now with the success of the coffin tooth campaign we're hoping oh, okay time is now to raise the finishing funds for this project um and that project's called night living dead genesis it's a uh, prequel reboot sequel to the original night living dead and uh it's starring judith o'day the original barbara and she's playing an older version of barbara Mm -hmm. um and so that project even though it's not done yet and you know we won't be finishing it until next year um that project's probably the most special but coffin tooth um is a different kind of special and the reason is i kind of feel like all of my films you can definitely tell that I have a certain style and I, you can definitely see that style and there's in, uh, and almost tropes in a way in all my projects. This one is a culmination of everything that I've done in the past kind of wrapped together and turned into an all new uh, beast. Basically it's the biggest budget that I've technically worked with. I shouldn't say, I mean, night living dead's a completely different animal. I don't even know how much I'd have to sit here and calculate how much money was put into that movie so far <laughs> that one's a different animal as far as like straight lace down in the dirt indie movies coffin tooth is the uh the biggest budget i've worked with so far and i think we're eyeing somewhere in a ballpark of about twenty thousand um total for coffin tooth and um to put that in perspective beneath your dark house that just came out had a total budget of five thousand Part. which it's fucking massively apart and you don't know how hard it is to put together a feature length movie on five thousand dollars um but i feel like no matter how low of a budget shitty movie that i've made in the past i do feel like i have at least um a nice visual style and mm-hmm. this this movie is that times 10 um very visual uh, i get to get the, i get to be a little bit more creative um so yeah this is this is the most special uh indie it's it, like i said it's hard it's hard for me to say between night of living dead genesis and coffin tooth uh-huh. they're both special for different reasons but for for sake of you know not being a four-hour show and we're talking about coffin tooth i'll say yes coffin tooth is very special because it is different and it's uh technically the type of film that i've always wanted to make if that makes sense mm-hmm. No, um, so I definitely want to talk to you about Night of the Living Dead. That is amazing. I gotta know more about that. But um, so what make what make you think that the reason why so many people rally behind Coffin Tooth? Because I remember, you know, I do remember you making your post on Facebook about, you know, if you should do a finishing funds. I know you was kind of up in the air on that. And as mm. soon as you post it, it's like you already hit, you know, your stretch goal in a matter of a couple, you know, uh, a couple of days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and what's like, funny? Everybody. What's funny is um, this campaign was only uh, three weeks long, mm-hmm. and 
we hit 11, over 11,000 in three weeks, which, I mean, of course there's, there's, you know, there's people out there right now, it's raking in big money for their movies. For me though, it was a huge fucking W uh, yeah. <laughs> because, um, and, I, and this might be good for other filmmakers to listen to, uh, when you're doing a campaign, it's all I've learned very quickly uh, just from doing the last one and in uh, the one that I've done for Field Dark House is how to work your crowd. It's almost like a, how a comedian or somebody, you know, you, you got to work your crowd. You got to, you got to see what works, what doesn't, who, who gravitates towards what kind of perk, who gravitates towards this and that. And you got to, you know, figure out, well, what sells best and, and everything. So um, to make, to make this successful, I knew that anything more than three weeks was not going to work because people see a campaign, they see that you've got 60 days or 90 days to raise this money. And a, and a person's mind who either A, is not working on the movie or B, doesn't even know how movies work. And their mind is nothing, it's nothing against you, it's nothing negative, but they see your campaign, they see 60 days, they see 90 days, they see hell 30 days. They're like, oh, He'll, they'll, they'll get that. No, no worries. They've got plenty of time. And then before you know it, they fucking forget. And then it's, it's, it's all over with. You set your campaign for um, 30 days or less. You're actually going to get more traffic because you're, you're showing people you've got less time to hurry up and, 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 and get, get those perks in. Um, and then you, you've got to realize this sounds weird because I hate people. I know this is really weird. I, I, I hate, I hate people um, dealing with people in, in the world and stuff like that, even though I'm, I try to be nice to everyone. Um, but you've got to, you've got to learn people and see what they like. And you, a lot of things is with, with people who don't necessarily make movies, everybody wants to be a part of a movie. And something that I've always heard since day one of, of working on movies is, Hey, uh, I'll be in your movie. Can I be in your movie? Or, hey, I'll just be a random redneck or I'll just be a random zombie or I'll be this. I'll... And people are always coming coming to you. Even if you haven't talked to this motherfucker in 10 years, they come out of the woodwork. Hey, man, I'd like to be in your movie. And that's when you realize, oh, okay, well, I need to make money. I need, I need to make this movie. You can't be in this movie unless I hit this goal. You want to be in the movie? I'll tell you what, here's a perk. You can be a party goer. You get to be seen on screen for like five seconds. You get to be in the fun. You get to be in the movie. We got the money. You're happy. I'm happy. Awesome. And uh, so I think that's the biggest thing is, again, working your crowd, seeing what works, what doesn't work, and remembering that people want to be a part of the movie no matter what. Oh, yeah. And it's funny because those same some of those people, you know, they'll be like, oh, well, you know, his movie, blah, 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 blah. Oh, what's that? I can be in it. Oh, well, hey, you know, it's, it's always, it's always those kind of plays. Um, and you just got to remember nothing's personal. Nobody means anything, you know, malicious or whatever. It's just how people work. And you gotta, you gotta, again, learn people, you gotta learn how they work and uh, you will get a successful campaign if you do those things. And probably the biggest thing that I left out is it will mentally exhaust you to no end, but you have to post at least five times a day because, and it all comes down to algorithm. Um, mm -hmm. Facebook or social media is only putting out there certain things that get hits, right? Mm -hmm. And it, um, what's weird is, I don't know if anybody else has experienced this or tried this, but like if you're sharing your link, okay, you make a post and you share your link to your campaign in the post. For whatever reason, the algorithm picks up that you're sharing a link and they don't, they don't promote it because it's not a link that is sending that person to anything that's Facebook related. So your link kind of gets pushed down the algorithm. But if you make a post and say, hey, you know, today's goal was this, this, and this, uh, check it out, comments below, you make that post and then wait about five seconds and then come through in the comments and post that link. That post is higher up in the algorithm because the algorithm is not picking up the link. It's picking up your post. And then people will go to your comments and that's, and that, that worked. It drove more people to the campaign and you can actually look at your post and see that you get more likes and more, and more, uh, and more traffic when you make a post with the link in the comments.
so no, anyway, I, that's that's no, um, that, that that's that's uh, literally like what I, what I was referring to when it's like my plan worked. I sat down and made a plan like, okay, this, this, and this, and this, and learning, you know, how to, how to work people and, and, and giving them what they want and the right way to try to fight the algorithm. That's the best ways to become successful with your campaign. And that's honestly what spearheaded me uh, saying, okay, we're going to do Night Living Dead next because I shit you not. Our very first uh, campaign for Night Living Dead Genesis, which was again, like a decade ago now, we raised five thousand dollars. Okay, that covered the first three days of filming. Wow. So I sank a shit ton of my own money into the movie. I had a, a gentleman uh, jump on as an executive producer, who you know he put down a, a large chunk uh, for the movie, and even then it, it ended up not being enough. So with with what I've learned with Coffin Tooth and this campaign and how to work things. That's why, you know, we're trying to spearhead and do My Living Dead next and do a finishing funds campaign for that. And hopefully it's just, it's as successful, if not more successful than Coffin Tooth. For sure. I mean, how you navigate it, because I mean, every time I would get on Facebook, I mean, I'm seeing something about Coffin Tooth. And I'm like, man, I'm gonna give this guy more of my money, you know? <laughs> you know, you don't know, there's so many indie uh, filmmakers out there, you know, pushing their, their movies. It's like, okay, I can't, I can't do everything. Right. So right. what do I and what you mastered was, you know, tapping into what people want to see and what people want to, you know, want to do. And I'm like, Matt, all right, man, here we go. Here goes some money. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another thing. Um, I think, I, you know, every, everything that I just named is like the most crucial elements to, to being successful. Um, I would say the cherry on top of, of that to be successful um, is be humble, um, be thankful to everybody that is helping you, uh, that mm -hmm. everybody that is chipping in. I mean, hell, I didn't know you, uh, before this, and now here we are sitting and talking and, you know, you, you just got to remember like, you know, to be humble, don't let anything go to your fucking head. Remember that you're, you're a human being that's just trying to do something fun and mm -hmm. that, that these other people, you know, they see something in you and they see something in your art that they, that they like. And, you know, they want to chip in and be humble to them, be thankful to them. And, uh, you know, always, that just sounds stupid, but, you know, goofy or whatever, but always just be good. Try to be uh, a good person. And I, I think uh, you'll be hugely successful. Oh, yeah, for sure, man. That's why I think what kind of pulled me to to coffin to was not only like, you know, you're scrolling down, you know, Indiegogo, you're like, okay, what is this? What is this? What is this? It's like, you know, when you see you personally you know interacting with people and you know you're a very likable person it's like okay i can definitely give this this guy some money because you know he's likable and and what you're doing you know making a new horror film you know with a new character who we haven't seen before you know you're not trying to remake some of the same stuff um so i think you know people can appreciate that um now the question I had, though, is that do you think indie filmmaking is coming to a, a halt, though, or do you think it's going to explode more more than ever? Uh, <clears throat> it's definitely not coming to a halt. Um, I, I think, especially with like what's going on with the WGA right now and the writer's strike, um, stuff like that, like, <sighs> so everybody loves an indie filmmaker when it's something that when that indie filmmaker is making something that they like, right? Mm -hmm. um, but and this is this is again this is not a this is not a slight against anybody. This is I'm not trying to sound like a dickhead or anything. But I notice a lot in like today uh, when the when the writer strike officially you know, the hammer kind of came down, uh, which is terrible. People's out of jobs. Writers aren't getting paid enough money. It's it's fucking bullshit. It's terrible. Um, however, on the flip side coin of that. A lot of the posts I was seeing today was, uh, you know, like indie writers who's not part of the WGA, like, oh well, I'm going on strike too, and it's like, what the fuck, are you talking about? You're why are you going on strike? You have nothing to do with any of this. You're you're an independent filmmaker. Keep fucking making your art because <laughs> guess what? I you, we don't want to work for these corporate dick bags. We don't want to, you know. Be, be a fucking, uh, you know, a puppet on a string when it comes to the big wigs. We want to make our indie movies. 
But, you know, a strike goes on for a long time. People start getting hungry for new content. Guess who they're going to turn to? They're going to turn to the indie guys because, you know, content, content, content. That's what we keep learning, right, with streaming services and Mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. So uh, I think indie filmmaking is actually going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, even though I'm not a fan, look at filmmakers like Ari, uh, Ari Aster, um, you know, Hereditary, which I did, which I did uh, like, was a huge success. And that was, a, and that's an indie film. Um, mm. You know, now he's climbing up the ladder. He just made this movie, Bo is Afraid, which not my type of movie, not something that I'll ever watch. But holy shit, I mean, Joaquin Phoenix, you know, he's doing, doing bigger and better things. And you know, look at A24. A24 is a studio that I also don't care for, but holy shit, they made Ty West Pearl X, and they also, um, you know, worked on many of other projects here and there that are phenomenal, and they're technically an indie, indie uh, people. So yeah, indie films are going to keep ballooning and getting bigger, and that's why I say uh, filmmakers need to stay humble. Yeah, and 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 help each other out because. There might come a time when they need, you know, they need people need to turn to indie filmmakers. Like, hey, we we need you guys to hire you guys, do this, that, and the other. Um, so I, I I think that indie filmmaking right now is probably in the best place that it's been in since the '80s. And what's weird about saying that is indie filmmaking now is completely different than it was in the 80s but what people don't remember or realize is in the 80s you didn't have jack offs like me we, you know out here running around in the backyard with a nice camera making an indie film it wasn't really like that then except for your shot on video stuff um but people forget that you know the greatest horror film of all time halloween the independent film 300 some thousand dollars and what's funny is when you hear John Carpenter talk about Halloween, they talk about the $300,000 budget. They really talk about it like if that was a lot of money. And the biggest difference between then and now is, do you know what the fuck I could do with $300,000? That's, <laughs> That's true. So it's, it's weird. It's weird that it's changed like that. But when I say that um, the indie films are just, are, are just successful now, uh, just as big now as they were in the 80s is because even though it was a different breed of filmmaker in the 80s and a different style, um, these they were still churning things out left and right. Your mom and pop stores and shelves were getting filled with like the next fucking random horror movie. And uh, it was it was a big deal. And I feel like that really slowed down um, in the late 90s and into the 2000s. It was still a lot of you know straight to video indie things but the quality kind of dipped uh, the storytelling really took a nosedive and mm. i feel like you know mid 2000s they would kind of fluctuate and like you started getting like kind of like new new bigger names were popping up in there and stuff but now we're i feel like we're boomerang came back to the 80s where a lot of the indie filmmakers now are like those guys they're actually putting out quality indie content and it's not like a you know let's shoot this movie for a fucking dime and get it out as soon as possible. A lot of these indie filmmakers are taking the shit to heart and putting, you know, their heart and soul and style back into the indie, indie scene. And nothing, nothing proves that more than terrifier and terrifier too. Um, oh yeah. Those are quintessential indie films and um, they 100% create a, a new icon. Uh, Art the Clown is going to be around for a very long time. And what's crazy is this, you put the Terrifier and Terrifier 2, you put their budgets together, and it's still probably not going to meet some shitty horror film that just hit the, the theater, you know? And, uh, and the quality, the quality is, is on par with, with those films. So, yeah, I, I think we're going to start seeing almost a renaissance in the uprising of indie filmmakers, and we're going to start seeing more Art the Clowns. We're going to start seeing more people using... Uh, new fresh ideas for their characters because at the bottom of the day my one of my biggest rules has always been if you can't make uh a halfway decent movie for a dollar make something in that movie stand out and look fucking cool and if yeah. you got so so if it's a slasher film that if, if if your movie sucks and you've got a fucking dollar to your name to make that movie and the acting sucks 
make that killer fucking awesome. Make that killer look cool and stand out because no matter how bad your movie is, guess what? Us horror freaks, we see a cool looking killer. We're like, well, fuck, I got to check this out. And, you know, yep. and, and, it, it could be good. It could be bad, but whatever. At least try to do something cool, if that makes sense. No, no, that, that makes perfect sense. And I'm glad you kind of hit on that, especially with Terrifier and then Terrifier 2 and even All Hallows Eve. Um, mm -hmm. It's just like, I feel like, you know, ever since Terrifier, you know, was released back in like 2016 or whatever, Indy was already going going pretty strong. But it's like more people, oh. more people jumped in when the release of Terrifier 2 happened because they're like, you know, wow, you know, a guy made this with under under three hundred thousand dollars and now you know these guys are touring speaking of touring i heard coffin tooth and yourself will be at monster mania man so yep in october that? yep um so scream team releasing which is to me one of the best uh indie uh distributors out there right now uh so they released uh beneath beneath your dark house my previous movie and um oh. so I'm doing uh, Coffin Tooth and uh, I you know I'm in the middle of filming. So distribution really wasn't in my mind yet. Um, I knew that I probably would like to have gone with Scream Team again, but it's just mm -hmm. one, of those, one of those things where you don't know if they're going to be interested in another movie of yours. So, you know, whatever. But they reached out to me and they're like, hey, <laughs> we, uh, we, we won Coffin Tooth. I'm like, fucking cool. All right. So we, we've, already signed, we've already signed a deal. Uh, Coffin Tooth's already been picked up for distro through Scream Team releasing. So um, I knew that I want to take Coffin Tooth on like a little mini tour, do some conventions because I haven't done conventions in years. And um, Monster Mania in Maryland is only like a two hour drive for me. And I haven't been to Monster Mania in a few years and I always love going there. So I went to have me. So I just, it was simple. I went on the Monster Mania website and I couldn't find the vendor info for October. I could find the and vendor info for the other dates at the other locations, but not for this one. So I just hit up uh, Justin who runs Scream Team Releasing. I was like, hey man, do you, are you guys going to have a table at Monster Mania? And he's like, yeah, as a matter of fact, we are, why you ask? I was like, well, I was wondering, you know, I want to find out the vendor information. I was to see if he could get me the info. And instead he was like, why don't you just come and be at the table? I was like, cool. So I get to be at the Scream Team Releasing table. Uh, I can sign, sign anything that people want. And of course, we'll, there'll be copies of Beneath Your Dark House there, which is, you know, Coffin Tooth's technical first movie. And mm -hmm. uh, Coffin Tooth's going to be at the table. You'll probably see Coffin Tooth walking around a little bit and stuff. So, um, yeah, Monster Mania is going to kick off our first little mini tour. Uh, I don't know the other dates yet or the other conventions yet, but um, we'll, we'll be popping around for sure. Nice, man. I can't wait to run into you at one of these events, man. I'm, as soon as I saw you post that, I'm like, okay, now this... This is gold. That's great. Um, great marketing and all that stuff, and people are gonna love it. So, um, you know, just in closing, man, um, what is it that inspire you to keep going, even though you know you face those hardships of like you know, financials with with fun of the movie, casting, whatever. But what pushes you and motivates you to keep going? <clears throat> Oof. Um. So again, like I said, when we were talking about the hardships stuff, like I said, I, said I could write a book. And there was so much stuff that I could go into, but, you know, probably shouldn't. Um, but I will say this. I worked on a movie that I put my heart and soul into the script. And I was, you know, I was a co-director and a producer on it. And it was the worst experience of my entire life. And some shit happened. And uh, I, it put me in depression. And I was, you know, I was in depression for a while. And I quit filmmaking and even like the even the mention of of one of my movies or the fall of it literally made me like go into panic attacks and, and anxiety and shit. And uh, Beneath Your Dark House kind of helped helped me kind of climb out of that depression ever so slightly uh, enough so to finish the movie. But as soon as we finished filming the movie, more bullshit happening happened in post production on that film that kind of started making put me in depression again. And uh, I kind of had that, you know, that, that talk with myself, like, if this is going to keep happening, then maybe I shouldn't keep doing this because it's fucking with my mental health. It's, uh, yeah. it's hurting, it's hurting friendships because I'm losing friends over this shit because people can't, you know, egos can't get on the same wavelength. Um, 
and it was it was depressing and what really pulled me out of it was reactions to beneath Hill dark house and uh, the movie came out it was released and then next thing i know like people were hitting me up i've getting friend requests and people you know there's a lot of people that's talk shit about the movie but i don't care what the negative people say i made a movie for five thousand dollars fucking sue me um but the people who do like it you know it kind of reinvigorated that flame and um got me excited about filmmaking again <clears throat> and then when i kind of sat down and realized at the end of the day this is your movie this is your baby you have the power to stop anything that's going to fuck you over and you've got the power to make things happen and it was just like all right you know what trim the fat get people in here that's going to get the job done and do the job right and just fucking make your movie so i guess you could say what inspired me to keep going is myself like believe in yourself tell yourself fuck all the haters fuck all the people that's going to bring you down and hold you down and just power through that shit if you gotta do it yourself do it but um if if not definitely try to surround yourself with the right people yeah oh. okay hold on sorry my son just woke up but um all good no that that's beautiful man that's beautiful so um yeah so where can we all find you out on social media uh, you're you're normal like i wish i i wish you couldn't <laughs> um <laughs> I, I hate social media, man. The only reason I have social media is, is for two reasons, the two reasons only to promote, to pr promote my movies and to, you know, make, make, uh, take pictures of, of me watching Joe Bob Briggs or Sven Gulli. And that's about all my social media is about, but I'm on your typical bullshit. I'm on Facebook. Uh, just look for Matt cloud. I'm probably the only Matt cloud out there. Um, Instagram M cloud nine. Uh, you'll find me on there. Um, I have a Twitter, but don't follow me on Twitter because Twitter's fucking crazy. And I only check Twitter like once a month. So don't, don't, don't do that. Um, probably the best place to follow me is, is Facebook. Um, I'm hundred percent active on Facebook. I'm like 95% active on Instagram. For sure. My man, it has been, it's been good to, you know, actually, you know, talk to you camera to camera, but absolutely, uh, I actually enjoyed it. So yeah, so that's all I have for today. Now, so Coffin Tooth will be coming out 2024, or should we get yes. it? Yes, it, it, it'll be out 2024. Um, I first quarter probably 2024. Um, probably I you know I don't want to give certain dates because you never know what could happen. Uh, things mm -hmm. could get pushed back. Um, but as far as it stands right now, we're eyeing. I should say we're eyeing a uh, probably March release date 2024 however the uh theatrical world premiere will be before that our theatrical world premiere i can't promise will be december but uh, at least january probably february maybe for theatrical premiere and i, I don't think i've even announced this yet so this might be an exclusive um oh, right. even though even though this even though the date's not set um because the movie's not even done yet um uh, i can announce that uh like beneath your dark house coffin tooth will have its world premiere at the alamo draft house uh in winchester virginia so there's there's that there we go all right heck yeah man well had a blast talking to you so uh anything else you want to say in closing or, or anything for all your God, I feel like I <laughs> fans out there I feel like I've talked enough. Um, <laughs> I I, uh, I talk uh, talk a lot. Um, no, I don't really have anything else to say other than you know if you're if you're an indie filmmaker, keep doing your keep doing your thing. Be humble and uh, you know uh, keep you know keep a strong heart. And uh, to to fans, thank you. You guys are awesome, wonderful, and thank you for uh, helping us make this movie. All right. So I'll actually hit you up as soon as I end this recording and all that good stuff, just because I do have some questions for you. Yeah, no problem, dude. Okay. All right, boss. It's been a pleasure. And I'm going to go ahead and upload this so you'll have all the information and stuff here shortly. Okay. Perfect, man. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. No, you have a good one. Okay. You too. All right. Bye -bye.